We're going through our series, Gentle and Lowly, which uh, if you haven't got the book, still a good time to buy it. So we're, we're only about 11 parts through it. It'll take us right through till, till Christmas. Uh, and really that book is just to help us do what I think is probably the best thing. You know, as, as a team, we thought, well, what should we preach about through this next season? I think the conclusion was the more we can look at Jesus and be kind of freshly engaged with him, then that's, that's going to do us all good, isn't it? So this book um, is just really a collection of looking at the attributes of uh, Jesus, looking at what he's like, some of the things that the Bible tells us uh, uh, about him, and then just sort of gives us some verses that we can then sort of preach in uh, on the back of just to try and expand those thoughts a little bit more. So this time we're looking at the emotional life of Christ. And just uh, one verse, just to sort of, which will we'll, we'll, uh, anchor our, some of our thoughts in, um, which we'll come back to um, shortly. But I'll just read it. And this is where <clears throat> um, Mary and Martha um, are facing the, the death of Lazarus. And um, Lazarus has, has just died. And uh, she says... Uh, in verse 32 of John chapter 11. Um, she says, When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And in verse 33, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I just wonder whether we might just need, got a little bit of echo on this, whether we might be able to do something about that. Is it all right for you to listen to? Because it's not all right for me to listen to. Was, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking I wouldn't want to listen to me, but you haven't got any choice really, have you, unless you go out. But uh, I'll carry on. Um, okay, so... So look at that, that verse is packed with emotion, isn't it? You know, Mary's brothers died. Uh, the verse before, she's sort of complaining at Jesus. Well, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, he then sees her emotion. He sees the emotion of all those who, who knew Lazarus and loved him. And, um, you know, Jesus himself then is just overcome with emotion. It's just like a very, very packed moment of, of humanity feeling something, you know, deeply, deeply distressing and, um, and disturbing. Now, you know, emotion is part of being human. It's part of how God made us, and we'll look at in a minute to see that it's actually part of being made in God's image. It's actually something that God himself feels. So emotion isn't, isn't a bad thing, and uh, I, I've often found that, uh, I mean, we're all a bit strange, aren't we? We're all, we're all very odd. <laughs> Uh, we're all quite different from one another. And um, the more you meet people, the more you realize everybody else is really odd except for me. Isn't that amazing? You just, you, we all think that, don't we? We all sort of think, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, what's the matter with these people? Uh, because we're all very, very different. And we all, we all, um, uh, 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 what a complex mosaic of, of little bits of emotion and all the rest of it. And so we want to sort of dig into emotion a little bit today just to sort of look at how that works a bit. Now, I've personally found over the years that something that's not particularly a biblical thing, but uh, um, going right back to sort of Greek philosophical thought, um, the four personality types, you know, phlegmatic, uh, sanguine, melancholic, and choleric, actually I think are pretty good summaries of where we all fit somewhere. And uh, Just to illustrate, if you think, well, I don't know what those mean, just to illustrate what those mean. Um, imagine you've got a, you're a farmer and, and, and your barn full of hay has caught fire. Right, and uh, there's four people looking at the barn on fire, all with different personality types. Now, the phlegmatic would say, oh dear, the barn's on fire. Um, someone ought to do something about that. that really, that's not good, is it? Someone really ought to do something about that. Yeah. <laughs> the choleric would say, right, you, 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 buckets, water, get in the line, here we go, you, now, now, come on, let's put this out. Choleric, we'll go straight into action. While the phlegmatic is saying, that's a good job someone did something about that, that needed doing. 
the melancholic would say, oh no, the barn, the barn, the barn, the barn. Oh, it's hopeless. Life's hopeless. I'm going to give up. It's hopeless. I'll go in there with the fire with it. Just what is the point in carrying on? And the sanguine would say, excellent. Where are the marshmallows? <laughs> now, none of those... Now, according to what personality type you are, you will assume one of those is correct or, or the best way to be. But it isn't about right or wrong. It's the fact that we're all different. And we all react to things differently. We all handle difficult things differently. And what's, what also complicates emotion as people is that our cult, the culture anyone lives in um, does condition us to what is appropriate and inappropriate behavior. I think we, we struggle in the UK to have what I think is more a more biblical worldview of emotion, uh, which is more expressive. I think we struggle if you're born in the UK and born in that culture because we tend to have uh, a culture that says you hide your emotions, uh, you, don't, you don't parade them because mostly that's seen as a sign of weakness uh, or a sign of vulnerability. Whereas many um, East, uh, global cultures in the East or the South would be much more tactile, much more expressive, there'd be much, many more tears both of happiness and joy. Uh, and I think rather than us saying, well, yes, well, we're all different, <clears throat> actually, no, we should say, well, we actually have to learn a little bit more how to have a biblical worldview uh, and not think that our culture is, you know, that's the way it should be, the sort of British stiff upper lip sort of thing. So it's a stronghold, actually. It's a real stronghold. It holds us back from worshipping God. Really? It does. It hinders us. And it holds us back in our relationships with each other. And it also holds us back in our own journey of maturing in Christ because we don't often always know how to deal with emotions, particularly in, in the West. We notice, you know, if you notice about Jesus' prayer life, for example, it says Jesus prayed with loud cries and tears to his Father in heaven. Would that be a feature of your usual prayer habits? Probably not, I would guess if you're from a UK culture. However, many cultures um, where the church you know, is in the world that aren't like that, you know, if you're not crying, it's more unusual. You know, it's just like much more, you know, it's, it's felt. It, it, things have to be felt, not just understood. We tend to live in a culture that thinks, well, if I understand it, then that's, that's how I've then grown, because I've understood but I do think there's a worldview, a biblical worldview that says some actually feeling is about is also a channel to growth, not just information. So we feel more in a godly way, as well as know more, perhaps. Um, things to ponder. I think other things that can affect our emotions are mental health issues. They can skew our emotions. Identity issues, control issues, rejection issues, suppressed grief issues, abuse issues, trauma issues. All of us, to some degree, are affected by things that may have happened to us or things we've experienced or things that we've had to journey through, and they do affect us. The, 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 we can't, if we think we've sailed through something and it hasn't affected us, and actually, that's a form of denial in itself. We're just not in touch with ourselves often enough, or deeply enough, to really know um, what we're processing. Now, all of the sanguines in the room will be thinking, oh, we don't need to talk about this, it's a lovely sunny day, move on. Um, because they'll think, well, oh, they're always upbeat, always upbeat. The melancholics will be thinking, oh, yeah, I am, I've got all of those things you said, I'm all of those. And more, I could write a few more. I'm, re I'm in real trouble. I live in the wrong culture. I've got mental health issues now. What? You know, there's just so many different reactions, even to what I've said so far. I haven't even started, really. Because in, our emotions are just very, very different from each other and very, very sensitive to different stimulus. One thing I do know is this. 
that with what we've all journeyed through across the globe with COVID, that's a massive, massive emotional impact on everybody. Massive. And for many of us, you know, we can feel we're sailing through it very well. But yep, resilient, bounce back, come on. Here we go. Sanguine approach. It's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Or a choleric approach. Right, come on. Let's, let's, let's uh, face what's ahead. Let's, let's navigate our way around it. Boom, mission. Off we go. The phlegmatic will probably say, all right, I guess, uh, oh, never mind. It's sort of like, you know, it's just whatever. <laughs> there will be so many things. But we have all been traumatized to some degree. You might think, well, that's a bit of a strong word. No, I don't think it is. Every single person on the planet has had to face life being completely disrupted from what has been. And we're now in the, in the situation where we're having to learn how to navigate life as it is now. So understanding our emotional life, understanding how we are as human beings, understanding how, how our emotions work, I think really important and it's also important that we understand and here we come back to the main point now to the verse it's really important that we understand we're not journeying through our emotions on our own well, praise god we have one another which is actually part of christ's provision we are ambassadors of christ we're we're here for each other we're family together we are to you know Bear with one another's bear each other's burdens, encourage one another, strengthen one another, comfort one another. We do need each other. That's part of God's provision. But also, we do need to know that Jesus feels very deeply what we're feeling. And you might think, well, nobody really understands me. Well, he does. I mean, it really does. That sounds like a very, very trite answer. But he does know you because he made you. And he understands what you've been through. He's, there's not been a thought or a word or a situation you face that Jesus hasn't known it all together. So he's, you can't present him with something about you that he goes, oh, I didn't realize that. He knows you actually better than you know yourself, better than I know myself. Psalm 139 says, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. <laughs> he's so completely aware of how we think, what we feel. That he knows what we're going to say. Not just because he's got some future sight of it, not only that aspect, but it's just he knows how we're wired so well that he knows exactly how we respond to everything. There's a, there's a much greater depth of his understanding than we realise. And, and we can get very disappointed with ourselves, can't we? Do you agree? You get, get disappointed with yourself? Well, Jesus, and disillusioned. Anyone ever been disillusioned with themselves? Think, I'm really worse than I thought I was. You know... Jesus is never disillusioned with us. Why? Because he never had any illusions in the first place. His love to us is based completely upon what he's known we are like right from the beginning. And it didn't put him off then when he went to the cross. It's not putting him off now. Because he knew exactly what he was taking on and what he was giving himself for. He didn't do that and then think, oh, what a surprise. Pfft, actually, if I'd have known now what they were all going to be like, I don't, know I'd have done, I don't know if I'd have done that. That is never, ever going to happen in Jesus' thought because he completely got us right from the beginning. Because he's made us, he understands us. And the way we are often disappointed with ourselves and disappointed with each other, which is another factor, particularly in COVID, because we're all looking for someone to blame. So somebody just steps one, one step out of the way and blah, blah, blah. just blah, it comes out, doesn't it? Very heightened emotions. That's what happens in a trauma. Everything gets skewed. And Mary here is in the middle of a trauma. A big trauma. You know, her brother's died. Her brother's died. And, and we find that, you know, just as she did, she, in, she jumped straight to having a go at Jesus. <laughs> so, well, if you'd have been here, it wouldn't have happened. She jumped straight to, well, it's your fault. How many times do we all do that? Am I the only one? 
And even if we don't say it, we think it. Think, well, Lord, if you'd have been in charge, COVID wouldn't have happened. If you'd have been in charge, this relationship wouldn't have broke down or this situation I'm facing wouldn't have emerged. If you'd have been in, where are you? If you'd have been in charge, none of this would have happened. Mary's, man, she's asking a reasonable question, isn't she? Please nod out. I know you've got masks on, but you, you look as if you're all dead. You know, just do something to, just to give you some signs of life. Right? Uh, she went where we would normally go, didn't she? Straight there. Well, what, why? Why? This is your fault. If you'd have been here, it wouldn't have happened. Is that a reasonable thing for her to say? It is, isn't it? Because she knew he had the power of, of life and death. She knew, she knew he could have fixed it. But interestingly, Jesus doesn't actually answer her point. <laughs> Just completely ignores the question. And instead, cries with her. Isn't that interesting? That he considered... Well, no, let me just, no, let's dig into that a bit more. Let's just consider that. He was more affected by the emotion of the situation himself than he was thinking about the answer. Now, that's a, that's a thought. That's a thought. That when we come to Jesus with our big questions, maybe he's just actually feeling in his heart, some of the pain that we're carrying. And he, he's almost thinking, like, don't talk to me about that now. I'm just feeling what you're feeling. That makes him quite almost human. Funny that, isn't it? Almost human. We don't often think Jesus is really human. We know it says it in the Bible he is, but we think, well, he's not like us. What are you upset? He's upset. He doesn't want to go into a big apologetic about the providence and sovereignty of God just at that moment. He, Lazarus was his friend. He died. So we've got to, to, to help us understand Jesus' emotion and where it can help us, um, we, do have to really, we do have to do a little bit of theology. So I'll just get, just get a little bit of a theological thing here about Jesus' humanity. Right, now, the Bible says that there's, a, there's, there's only one God. Right? God is one. And yet the Bible talks about God as three. Father, Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And yet there's only one God. Not three gods, not even three bits of a God. God is one, but yet God is three what we call persons. Although that word isn't used in the Bible, three, three persons, because it's the best word we can think of. And each of those persons of the Godhead is fully God and doesn't need the other two to be complete God. So the Father is fully God, Jesus is fully God, the Holy Spirit is fully God. And yet there's only one God, and yet there's three persons, and each person's fully God. Now, if you're thinking, I can't reconcile that, then you've probably actually just understood the Trinity correctly. If you get to the point where you think, ah, yes, well, it's like water, ice, and steam, or three uh, a three-leaf clover. No, it isn't. That's a heresy, which used to be taught proficiently in Sunday schools. We teach our children heresy. Because we like to try and make it all simple, don't we? Well, this is what it's like. We can't understand the Trinity. We can understand what the Bible reveals about God, but he's, he, he's transcendent. In other words, he lives in a realm beyond us, and he's comprised in a way that's beyond our realm of understanding. We can't completely understand, but we can believe in what the Bible tells us. God is one God. And that one God, God the Father, in a moment of history, God the Son, in response to the Father's will, came to earth and took on humanity became a human being. Jesus wasn't a human being from eternity. There was a moment when he became incarnate. He took on flesh in a moment of history, lived a life as a human being, just like us, in the same way as Adam represented us, was the first man in the garden. So Jesus, 
is our second Adam, exactly the same as the first Adam, except that he didn't sin. It's the only difference. So Jesus took on everything it means to be human. Why? Well, partly so that he can fully, completely represent us. Because if Jesus is not a human being and he died on the cross, then he's not our representative, is he? He's something a bit different. He's kind of something on his own. So we can't say, well, I'm in Christ. Because how can you be joined with something that you're not, you know, how can he represent you? So he had to be fully like us, but he also had to be fully God because there's no human being alive that can possibly save us because we're all sinners. So he had to be fully God as well to be completely sinless. So God and man in one person, Jesus Christ, coming to earth, fully God, fully man, really important we understand this, so that when he died, he's dying to represent us because he is one of us, just like us. But he's also God taking our sins on his shoulders in a way that no human being can ever do anything redemptive for any one of us. We might want to save one another, but we can't because we're in just as much need ourselves of a saviour. And the amazing thing is that when Jesus died and then he was buried and then he rose again, he rose again physically as a human. We have a man in heaven today. He's taken our humanity back into the heavenly realms. Now, it, this all blows my mind, right? But I just, I think it's ever so important we understand this because it really does help us. You might think, what's this got to do with emotion? Well, we'll get there, all right? At about uh, three o'clock, we'll get there, right? So just on a slight detour. Um, the reason this is important is when Jesus rose from the dead, he had his resurrection body, which was both the same as his original body, because they recognized him, didn't they, when he met with his disciples? They didn't go, well, they did go, Woo, you know, at first, but they knew who he was. And he ate some fish or whatever. You know, he was a human being still. But he got a resurrection body that was somehow heaven and earth had merged in this resurrection body. Which Paul says when, in Corinthians, he reflects on this and he says, some people think, well, what's the resurrection body going to be like? And he said, foolish people. Because I think it's a reasonable question myself, but he didn't seem to think so. He said, if you look at some seeds and, you know, you put them in the ground, we never imagine that what the seed looks like, that the flowers, we never imagine the flower is going to come from the seed, do we? Because you think, well, that, how did that come from that? It's just amazing. And he said, it's just like that, first the natural, then the spiritual. He, he says, if you see how flowers are from seeds, they're just incredible. You couldn't have imagined what they were going to turn into. Well, so with Jesus, his body rose from the, the grave. Still Jesus, still recognizable as Jesus, still able to be touched and held and talked to and just who he was before. But somehow heaven had made his body now incorruptible, eternal, immortal. He's not, not able to die anymore. And the Bible says, this is really, I think, something really we should be more and more thinking about this. Those of us who've got loved ones who are now with the Lord, they don't have their resurrection bodies yet, right? They're with the Lord, which the Bible says is far better. So that'll do for me. We know it's far better. But they haven't got their resurrection bodies yet. When Jesus returns, they and Jesus and those of us who are left will somehow be caught up together as heaven and earth merge in some amazing renewal of all things. And when we pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that is the consummation of that prayer, where heaven and earth merge and the renewal of all things takes place. All of our bodies, all of you beautiful people here, will look even more glorious. You'll still be recognizable, but there'll be something about you that everyone goes, whoa, have some fish. You know, there'll be something about you that makes you makes you, ex you know, how did that come from that? And Jesus and the earth, we will still live on the physical earth. This earth is not going to be destroyed. It's going to be renewed. So it will still be recognizable, but it will be glorified. And heaven, we're not going to go and float on some fluffy clouds. Heaven's going to come down to earth. Earth's going to go up to heaven. And there's a new city, the new Jerusalem. It's image of the old Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. There's something about the renewal of all things. And all those who've died in the Lord will then be raised with their bodies, recognizable as they were, able to talk, able for us to touch them, hug them again, speak to them, but somehow they'll be raised incorruptible. That's the Christian hope. That's the Christian hope. That's what actually our hope is. 
it's not of dying and going to heaven, it's of heaven coming to earth and the whole thing being re- renewed and made again, never for us ever to die again. Having the same resurrection bodies as Jesus now has. I just thought that was important to say that because our emotions likewise will be renewed. We will still have our personalities. We will still be who we are. But now, now, I don't know whether it means all the sanguines will become <laughs> cholerics or whether all the phlegmatics, well, they won't really care what happens to them, will they? But, you know, I don't know what it means. I don't know. That's why, probably why Paul said foolish, you know, it's a foolish question. I don't know. We'll still be who we are, but somehow our emotions will be liberated from the, 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 the fall and all the brokenness that goes with being you and goes with being me, all the brokenness that even now our, our minds are being renewed daily by the Spirit, aren't they? But we know we're not fully there yet. It says when we see him, then we'll be like him. There's something, a future hope. But it, I think it helps us to think Jesus... Well, it helps me anyway. Perhaps I'm just talking to myself. I don't know. It helps me to think Jesus understands my emotional baggage because he felt the same things but without sin. So he, he can help me. Isn't it, have you ever had that experience where you're really, I don't know, troubled about something or you want to talk something over with someone and you find just the right person and when you sit down and you talk about it, they get it. Have you ever had that? Isn't it liberating? You think, I don't, you totally get me. You totally get what I've just said. You, you absolutely, and they even sometimes say things that are deeper than you were going to say because they've thought through more than you, they've understood you better than you understand yourself. Isn't that incredible when that happens? It's a wonderful thing. Well, Jesus is exactly like that all the time with us. I find that very, I don't know, relaxing. And most of life, really, for us, really, should be about just pursuing his heart so we listen to what he says. Because it would put everything in much more perspective for us, wouldn't it? It would make us all feel, oh, it's okay, you understand. That's okay. I feel better. I know, you understand. I know you understand. Calvin said of Jesus, he said, The Son of God, having clothed himself with our flesh, of his own accord, clothed himself also with human feelings, so that he did not differ at all from his brethren, sin only accepted. Amazing. Jesus is an emotional person, but he's not driven by any kind of imbalanced reactionary emotions. He's not distraught or in despair, as we often get. He's not kind of, oh, what on earth can be done? It's all so hopeless. Rather, he feels a perfect proportionate balance and a control on one hand but an extensive depth of feeling on the other. So he's more in control of his emotions than anyone else, but he feels more deeply about our pain than we even do. Isn't that amazing? His extremity of his emotional strength. He's not phased by anything that you or I might bring to him, or we might bring to him. He's not phased by it, but he feels it more deeply than we ever do. What a, what a saviour. You can never burden him with something he can't cope with. And you can never feel something as pain as deeply and as strongly as he can feel it. He's always bigger than our extremities. So, just to come into land, a few things just to help us uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe grow a little in this. I don't know. Um... I think it's good for us to be honest about the fact that Romans 12 needs to be, you know, something we live in in, in sight of. Romans 12, uh, where it says, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, this is your spiritual worship. I mean, singing songs is, is part of worship, 
But that, that's not actually the definition of worship. Worship is being transformed by the renewing of how we think and feel. You know, presenting ourselves living sacrifices, becoming more like him, becoming more um, in love with him, more obedient to him, more... Um, I don't know, dependent on him. Dependency on Jesus isn't a weakness, it's a strength. It's, it's, it's a sign of growth. It's a sign of spiritual depth. The more weak you feel as a, as a human being, but the more strong you feel in him shows that you're growing in God, not that you're becoming more of a weak person. So that's important. It's also important that we are to remember that we are followers, we are ambassadors. So therefore... We should remind people of Christ uh, as we go about our lives, which means that, you know, not just our behavior, sort of being not those that sin or, you know, can have any charge made against us to bring disrepute to Christ's name, who we say we follow. We shouldn't live like that. But also, maybe letting our emotions being transformed to be a bit more like his way of his emotional being. That's a, that's a bit of a journey, isn't it? I think, am I, do I feel like Christ feels? And if not, how do, I, how do I begin to journey that? How do I begin to make steps in that? There's, there's a question for us, for each of us to, our, to answer. Um, that's a lifetime's work. To say, Lord, would you make me more like you in how I feel? You know, when we console one another or encourage one another or draw near to one another, just to have that heart of Christ more to pursue his heart becoming our chief pursuit in life and then the Bible says lastly it says the Bible says that we can feel his heart when we pray you know to be able to to be able to think when I pray I'm praying with Christ as well as to Christ and he is inhabiting um, he's inhabiting my prayers. Uh, maybe that might mean we cry a little bit more with him when we pray. Maybe if he's feeling it, maybe we'll feel it a bit more. Doesn't mean that we should try, you know, make that happen. But just, you know what I mean? There should be perhaps a little bit more resonance sometimes. Uh, we can catch his heart in compassion so that when we see people, um, that God gives us an opportunity to do something to help. That's what the Bible says. You know, Galatians 6.10 is our mantra. As you have opportunity, good, do good to everyone, especially those who are from the household of faith. Right? As you have opportunity. We can't fix everything, but as you and I have opportunity, whatever your opportunity is, we should do good to everyone. We should be a blessing to everyone that we have opportunity to. To everyone, especially the church family. That's what the Bible says for us to do. And then sharing his heart of vision and zeal for his purposes. And if you're feeling a bit flat about that at the moment, you're a bit punch drunk with COVID, then maybe you say, Lord, would you re renew my zeal? Would you renew my vigor? Would you do something in me that I can't do myself? Jesus said, if someone is thirsty, come to me and drink. Sometimes all you have to be is thirsty. Don't have to be, don't have to all have it all together. Just have to be thirsty. And we can feel his heart when we share the gospel with people. We're not selling hoovers. We're trying to just tell people there's a God who loves them and who's made a way for them to know him. Right? It's not about techniques. It's about his heart for someone that just doesn't know the Lord. Yeah, I think, that, I think that'll do. One last thing I would say. Um, I don't know, just something I've found more and more helpful in my, in my Christian um, walk um, is, is the gift of speaking in tongues. Um, I, I pray in tongues more now than I ever have. Every day, probably. And sometimes a lot of the day. 
just from time to time through the day. If I'm just thinking about someone or something's on my mind, I will imagine that person, I'll just bring them into my mind. <clears throat> I'll focus on them in my mind and I'll just pray in tongues because I think I don't know what to say. But I'm going to trust that if I've asked for bread, he's not going to give me a snake. I'm going to trust that as I pray in a spiritual language I've not learnt but God has given me, that the Holy Spirit somehow is going to present a perfect prayer for that person and that somehow breakthrough is going to come. I do that a lot. And I've found great comfort in that because COVID has removed all ability to forward plan. Hasn't it? Well, you know you might have your dinner today, fair enough. But you don't know if it'll be in the supermarket tomorrow, do you? You know, you know what I mean. All the certainty of anything has gone. I don't know what to pray, do you? If you do, come and tell me. I'll write it down. I'll do it when I get home. I don't know what to pray. So I just want to pray more Paul said, I pray with my mind, but I'll pray with my spirit. I'll sing with my mind, I'll sing with my spirit. I pray in tongues more than all of you. I'd love you all to pray in tongues. That is an apostolic encouragement. But Paul says, come on, this is a powerful thing. A powerful, powerful gift. Something to be really developed. Now you might think, well, what's that got to do with emotion? I tell you, the more you pray in tongues, the more you will start to feel the emotion of Christ. Because you'll be starting to get in touch with the Holy Spirit, who with loud groans and cries it says in romans 8 when we pray the spirit prays with us and we start to actually feel what god feels over a longer period of time and that can actually be really healing for us personally because we're getting more in touch with him and less sort of feel we're praying to him in some sort of distance <clears throat> i don't know i just felt to mention that i just think it's important for us as a church actually that maybe when we do start our prayer meetings i wouldn't say they should perhaps be a majority speaking in tongues, but it wouldn't be a bad thing. You think, oh, I've never done that before. Well, so, perhaps we should have been. <laughs> just a thought. Because when you don't know what to pray, well, let's just pray with what God gives us. Anyway, let's just stand. I'm just going to pray for us. I know I've slightly gone over time, I think. I don't know. Don't really mind. <laughs> as long as you don't mind. <laughs> As long as the chicken doesn't get burnt or whatever. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and also, if you think to yourself, well, yeah, I quite like the idea of praying in tongues, but I've never done it. Well, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in a few, uh, a few weeks' time, we're going we're gonna to do about five evenings on Sunday nights looking at life in the Spirit, and we're going to really go through gifts of the Spirit and things just to put a, you know, put a, have a bit of a fresh focus on that foundation of life in the Spirit. Uh, so we'll be, you know, going through all of that um, then a bit more. So I think it's something the Lord wants us to, life in the Spirit, just to, to be really people that are saturated with the Holy Spirit. We, we need him, don't we? At the moment, we, we need him. Because we're not, we're not going to thrive in this new world <laughs> without the Holy Spirit. We're really not. So... I don't, know, just, I don't know, if you're feeling, I don't know, you resonate with anything that you've heard this morning, that it just sort of I don't know, touches you in some way, then no, I'm not particularly looking. I don't, not really, I don't want to, I'm not particularly looking for a response or a reaction or whatever. I'm just going to lift my own hands to the Lord and shut my eyes so I don't know, I don't mind what you're doing. But if you feel you just want to, I don't know, uh, there's something you want to just respond to and receive the Holy Spirit afresh, just in some way, something God's just perhaps spoken to you about from what I've said, then just lift your hands to the Lord where you are and just, you know, just close your eyes, just make this very personal, just between us and the Lord. And just, uh, yeah, we just receive from you now, Holy Spirit. We receive from you, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're more willing to give than we are even to ask. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. Thank you, Lord. You said, Lord, if we're thirsty, come to you and drink, and out of our innermost being would flow rivers of living water. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who were going to believe later would receive. We've received of your Spirit, Lord. We ask now for fresh rivers to flow amongst us personally and amongst this church, Lord. We pray for rivers of living water to be going right across all the, in between the rows, the aisles, even... Uh, for people who are just a bit 
you know, separated still, not, not confident gathering yet, Lord. Wherever, wherever we are, whether we're gathered, scattered, Lord, we're still your body, still your sheep, still your people. We pray, Holy Spirit, would you start to let the rivers flow in living rooms, around kitchen tables, around the, these gatherings, Sunday mornings and evenings, around community groups, around all we're doing when we sh share our faith or when we pray on our own. Holy Spirit, flow. Start to flow, Holy Spirit. Start to flow. Let the rivers flow in, out of our innermost beings. Stir up, Lord. Stir up, Lord. Let, take the, the boulders out of the wells, things that have um, blocked the flow, Lord, things that have traumatized us, emotional baggage we're carrying. Lord, heal us, Lord Jesus, we pray. Let there be healing of, of damaged emotions, uh, all kinds of things that are just burdening us, worrying us, troubling us, things that have been painful. Lord, we ask you, Holy Spirit, the great physician, the one who Jesus said, when I go, another just like me is going to come, and he will comfort you, strengthen you, lead you into all. Holy Spirit, do your, do your work in us, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that it will flood out of us into those around us, Lord. We want it just, you need to start with us, Lord. Otherwise, we've got nothing to say. We've got nothing to give unless we don't first. What you've received, give, is what you said, Jesus. We want to receive afresh, Lord, so we've got something to give. Amen. Lord, so we pray, Lord, fill up the barns here, Lord. Fill up the storehouses of our hearts, Lord. Fill up, fill up, Lord, what's been depleted through these couple of years, Lord, of all sorts of things, Lord. Fill up, Lord, what's been depleted. And we pray, Lord, for folk just carrying heavy loads today, Lord. Just let those loads just fall into your loving hands, Lord. Just like Mary, you know, she, she wept and you wept with her, Lord. There's no need for words sometimes. Just bring your comforting, amazing, healing compassion. And then after that, you brought resurrection. You brought Lazarus back to life. You did what no one was expecting. Would you do here what no one's expecting? Would you do here what no one saw coming? Come on, Lord. Would you do what none of us saw coming? Just like you did for Mary. You comforted her for a while. You could have just gone straight to the big finale. But you didn't. You walked through the emotion for a while. And then, bang. No one saw that coming. Come on, Lord, we need you. We need you, Lord. Yes, Lord, we need you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. People are watching at, light, uh, uh, at home right now. Come, Holy Spirit. In lounges, in kitchens, on mobile devices. Come, Holy Spirit. In this room, with the children. Come, Holy Spirit. So many children have been so deprived of... Fellowship. Come on, Lord. Do something we didn't see coming across the ages. Thank you, Lord. 